Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for August 2nd through 8th, 2021. This is covering Doctrine and Covenants sections 85 through 87. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Oh, this is going to be wonderful. You know, we've said it before, but we just couldn't have a show without you, Scriptures. So glad you're here. (laughs) Now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. Nine minutes, 15 seconds. And what would it be daily? That would be one minute, 19 seconds. That's like no time at all. It really isn't. Listen, although the reading isn't very long, there's a lot to talk about. So if you want to study this by section, the time codes are here, or buckle up and let's get going. Let's start with section 85. The Institute Manual has some great introductory material. It says, By November 1832, more than 800 Latter-day Saints had gathered to the land of Zion in Jackson County, Missouri. It was expected that church members who settled in Zion would live according to the system of consecration commanded by the Lord. This meant that a member would consecrate or dedicate property and resources to the Lord through a legal deed that was signed by both the member and the bishop. In return, the member was given, through another legal deed, property and resources called an inheritance or stewardship according to the needs and wants of the member's family. Saints who settled in Jackson County, Missouri, and were obedient to the law of consecration, received an inheritance of land that had been purchased by church agents. In October and November of 1832, the Prophet Joseph Smith received correspondence from church leaders in Zion, including from William W. Phelps, who oversaw the church's printing operation in Independence, Missouri, as a member of the United Firm. On November 27, 1832, Joseph Smith wrote a letter responding to William W. Phelps's questions. The prophet was aware that some of the saints in Zion did not participate in the system of consecration required by the Lord, and he addressed the issue of whether land inheritances should be given to those saints who had not consecrated their property. Doctrine and Covenants 85 contains an extract from the letter that the prophet sent to William W. Phelps. Now, here's an interesting fact about this revelation. Section 85 was not included in the original 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, and it was also not included in the revision of the Doctrine and Covenants in 1844. It wouldn't actually be included until the 1876 edition, so long after Joseph's death. This is also true of section 77, which we studied before, in which we talked about the question and answer about the book of Revelation. That, too, was not included until the 1876. That's interesting. Well, let's take a look at the Revelation itself. So this is the segment of that letter to W.W. Phelps. Starting in verse 1, we learn the duty of the clerk. Verse 1, it is the duty of the Lord's clerk whom he has appointed to keep a history and a general record of all things that transpire in Zion, and of all those who consecrate properties and receive inheritances legally from the bishop, and also their manner of life, their faith and works, and also the apostates who apostatize after receiving their inheritances. It is contrary to the will and commandment of God that those who receive not their inheritance by consecration, agreeable to this law, which he has given, that he may tithe his people to prepare them against the day of vengeance and burning, should have their names enrolled with the people of God. Neither is their genealogy to be kept or to be had where it may be found on any of the records or history of the church. Their names shall not be found, neither the names of the fathers nor the names of the children written in the book of the law of God, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, that reference to the book of the law of God, it's interesting he mentions a term that their names wouldn't be enrolled with the people of God. That's interesting about being enrolled, kind of like being enrolled in a class or a program. 
here we are that where you would have your name is written in the book of the law of God. The Student Institute Manual helps to remind us that three record books are mentioned in this revelation. The book of the law of God in verses 5 and 7, and the book of remembrance in verse 9, and the book of the law in verse 11. It is likely that these descriptions all refer to the same book. Later, after the saints had settled in Nauvoo, Illinois, Joseph Smith directed that a record be kept containing his journal entries and a list of tithing donations made for the construction of the Nauvoo Temple. This book was also referred to as the book of the law of the Lord. Let's go on in verse 7. And it shall come to pass that I, the Lord God, will send one mighty and strong, holding the scepter of power in his hand, clothed with light for a covering, whose mouth shall utter words, eternal words, while his bowels shall be a fountain of truth, to set in order the house of God, and to arrange by lot the inheritances of the saints whose names are found, and the names of their fathers and of their children enrolled in the book of the law of God. While that man who was called of God and appointed, that putteth forth his hand to steady the ark of God, shall fall by the shaft of death, like as a tree that is smitten by the vivid shaft of lightning. That's a powerful, powerful image. So let's talk about that a minute. First of all, the phrase, steady the ark, what does that mean? Well, the ark in this context is the ark of the covenant. This is, according to the Bible dictionary, an oblong chest of wood overlaid with gold made by Moses at God's command. It was the oldest and most sacred of the religious symbols of the Israelites, and the mercy seat which formed its covering was regarded as the earthly dwelling place of Jehovah. And we'll talk a lot more about this next year when we cover the book of Exodus. Oh, yes. You may know the Ark of the Covenant as the star of the first Indiana Jones film. That's where I first learned about it. This object was not to be touched or even approached except in two special circumstances. Number one, it could be approached by the high priest who was a representation of Christ, but only once a year on Yom Kippur or the Day of the Atonement and only after an elaborate cleansing ritual. Or number two, by the Levites when the tabernacle was to be moved. In the days of King David, the ark was being transported to Jerusalem by ox cart driven by two men. One was named Uzzah. Uzzah was slain by the Lord when he disobediently attempted to steady the ark when the oxen stumbled. And we'll cover that next year, too. That's in 2 Samuel. Right. Now, President David O. McKay, in a conference report, April 1936, talks about that account and can give us some additional information as we think about that image in verse 8. This is from the Institute Manual. It says, It is a little dangerous for us to go out of our own sphere and try unauthoritatively to direct the efforts of a brother. You remember the case of Uzzah who stretched forth his hand to steady the ark. He seemed justified when the oxen stumbled in putting forth his hand to steady that symbol of the covenant. We today think his punishment was very severe, be that as it may. The incident conveys a lesson of life. Let us look around us and see how quickly men who attempt unauthoritatively to steady the ark die spiritually. Their souls become embittered, their minds distorted, their judgment faulty, and their spirit depressed. Such is the pitiable condition of men who, neglecting their own responsibilities, spend their time in finding fault with others. That's a great quote, and it reminds me of a favorite of mine. If I may paraphrase an alleged quote from Elder J. Golden Kimball, if the Lord can't take care of his own church, then what can I do? Right. <laughs> Very good point. So, one mighty and strong in verse 7. Who's that? Well, many people in the last two centuries have claimed that various presidents of the church have gone astray and have been fallen. And the one mighty and strong mentioned in verse 7? Why, 
that's me. <laughs> and my mom says I'm really handsome, too. Right. Well, that happened a lot, actually. There are several factions of the church that have started from someone who interpreted verse 7 as, oh, that's me. I'm here to clean up the church. Well, the Institute Manual includes an official statement issued in 1905 by the First Presidency. And at that time, the First Presidency was Joseph F. Smith, John R. Winder, and Anthon H. Lund, in which they discussed the circumstances that brought forth the prophecy recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 85, specifically verses 7 and 8, and those whom the phrases, one mighty and strong, and putteth forth his hand to steady the ark of God, referred to. They say, quote, Bishop Edward Partridge was one of the brethren who, though a most worthy man, one whom the Lord loved and whom the prophet described as a pattern of piety and one of the Lord's great men, at time arrayed himself in opposition to the prophet in those early days and sought to correct him in his administrations of the affairs of the church. In other words, put forth his hand to steady the ark. Through his repentance and sacrifices and suffering, Bishop Edward Partridge undoubtedly obtained a mitigation of the threatened judgment against him, of falling by the shaft of death, like as a tree that is smitten by the vivid shaft of lightning. So the occasion for sending another to fill his station, one mighty and strong, to set in order the house of God and to arrange by lot the inheritances of the saints— may also be considered as having passed away, and the whole incident of the prophecy closed, end quote. So, in other words, this prophecy stood as a warning to Bishop Partridge that if he would continue to steady the ark, he would be replaced by one mighty and strong. But what was the result? Bishop Partridge repented, and the fulfillment of the prophecy was unnecessary. He continues to be an inspiration to me. Yeah, Bishop Partridge is awesome. Yeah, no doubt. Well, let's go on in verses 9, 10, and 11 and keep looking for that phrase about the book of the law of God, starting in verse 9. And all they who are not found written in the book of remembrance shall find none inheritance in that day, but they shall be cut asunder, and their portion shall be appointed them among unbelievers." where are wailing and gnashing of teeth. These things I say not of myself. Therefore, as the Lord speaketh, he will also fulfill. And they who are of the high priesthood, whose names are not found written in the book of the law, or that are found to have apostatized, or to have been cut off from the church, as well as the lesser priesthood or the members, in that day shall not find an inheritance among the saints of the Most High. Now, imagine for a minute how you would feel if your name was missing from the Lord's Book of Remembrance. In verse 11, it reminds us, too, what it is that happens that cuts us off from that Book of the Law of God. And those ideas of apostatizing or being cut off from the church. And remember, it doesn't have to be a complete apostatizing either. How much are we participating? How much are we taking it into our hearts so that it changes us so that we can be worthy to be included in that book? In verse 12, Therefore it shall be done unto them as unto the children of the priest, as will be found recorded in the second chapter and 61st and second verses of Ezra. Now, that's interesting. Hmm, that is interesting. Here's another reference to the Old Testament. We're getting ready for next year. Yeah, we are. So excited. The book of Ezra, this is chapter 2, verses 61 to 62. So the context here is after the kingdom of Judah was conquered by the Babylonians, this was around 600 BC, remember the time of Jeremiah and Lehi? And Lehi, right. The Jews were forced to live in exile, and a later Persian king allowed the Jews to return to their homeland. When Ezra and Nehemiah were restoring the temple, the scriptures, and the general worship of God, Ezra helped organize the Aaronic priesthood and its officers. Some claimed to have been of the lineage of Levi or Aaron, but had no genealogical record to prove it. As a result, they were not permitted to participate in the office. Right. So that's what we're referring to in that description of verse 12. 
And it's a comparison, right? The idea is we need to find ourselves written in this book. Yeah, it's like our genealogy or worthiness to be able to participate. From the Institute Manual, we have a quote from then-President Dieter F. Uchtdorf. This comes from October 2014 General Conference. He says, quote, Your Heavenly Father has high aspirations for you, but your divine origin alone does not guarantee you a divine inheritance. God sent you here to prepare for a future greater than anything you can imagine. For this reason, we speak of walking the path of discipleship. We speak of obedience to God's commandments. We speak of living the gospel joyfully with all our heart, might, mind, and soul. End quote. So, what can we do to make sure our names are recorded in the Lord's Book of Remembrance? President Uchtdorf gives us great, simple, but clear instruction. All right, well, now let's go on to section 86. And the Institute Manual provides some introductory material. It says, sometime in the spring of 1831, the prophet Joseph Smith made inspired changes to Matthew 13 as part of his inspired translation of the New Testament. At that time, he made very few changes to the parable of the wheat and the tares recorded in that chapter. Now, if you haven't read the parable, it's found in Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30, and the Lord interprets it in 36 to 43. Going on. From July 1832 to February 1833, as Joseph was working on the inspired translation of the Old Testament, he reviewed changes he had made to the New Testament. While it is not clear whether he was reviewing Matthew 13 again or working on Old Testament passages regarding the gathering of Israel, his journal entry for December 6, 1832, which was the day the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 86 was received, states that he had been translating on that day and received a revelation explaining the parable of the wheat and the tares. Now, just to facilitate our discussion, here's a quick summary of that parable. A man who had a field planted good wheat seed in it. And while he slept, someone came and planted tares in the same field, which look a lot like wheat. All the seeds started to grow. A worker in the field Notice the tares growing with the wheat. He asked the owner, Didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? The owner of the field said that an enemy must have planted the tares. And when the worker asked if the tares should be pulled up and destroyed, the owner said no. If the tares were weeded out, he explained a lot of the wheat would be destroyed too, since they were growing side by side. So the wheat and tares were both allowed to grow until harvest time. Then the owner told the reapers to first gather and store the wheat safely in the barn, and after that was finished, they were to gather the tares into bundles and burn them. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the Revelation, starting in verse 1. Verily thus saith the Lord unto you, my servants, concerning the parable of the wheat and of the tares. Behold, verily I say, the field was the world, and the apostles were the sowers of the seed. Now, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 37, we're told, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. But are the apostles the authorized servants of Jesus Christ? Of course. Absolutely. And so both statements are accurate. By my own voice or the voice of my servants. It it is is the the same. same. In verse 3, And after they have fallen asleep, these are the apostles, The great persecutor of the church, the apostate, the whore, even Babylon, that maketh all nations to drink of her cup, in whose hearts the enemy, even Satan, sitteth to reign, behold, he soweth the tares. Wherefore the tares choke the wheat and drive the church into the wilderness. Okay. Well, if it helps, the 2001 Institute Student Manual has a little more information about literally what are we talking about with tares and maybe by literally understanding it it can give us even a little more insight to the spiritual meaning it says traditionally tares have been identified with the darnel weed a species of bearded rye grass which closely resembles wheat in the early growth period which is found in modern palestine this weed has a bitter taste if eaten in any appreciable amount 
either separately or when mixed with bread. It causes dizziness and often acts as a violent emetic, meaning it causes vomiting. And this is originally from the Bruce R. McConkie's Doctrinal New Testament Commentary. And also in verse 3, it mentions the phrase to drive the church into the wilderness. We're talking about apostasy there. Let's go on in verse 4. But behold, in the last days, even now, while the Lord is beginning to bring forth the word, and the blade is springing up and is yet tender, behold, verily I say unto you, the angels are crying unto the Lord day and night, who are ready and waiting to be sent forth to reap down the fields. But the Lord saith unto them, Pluck not up the tares, while the blade is yet tender. For verily, your faith is weak, lest you destroy the wheat also. As we take a look at verse 7, note the order of the gathering. And why is that important? Verse 7, Therefore let the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest is fully ripe, Then ye shall first gather out the wheat from among the tares. And after the gathering of the wheat, behold, and lo, the tares are bound in bundles, and the field remaineth to be burned. To summarize this idea, we have a quote from the Institute Manual. This is Elder Neil A. Maxwell from April 1996 General Conference. He says, quote, Church members will live in this wheat and tares situation until the millennium. Some real tares even masquerade as wheat, including the few eager individuals who lecture the rest of us about church doctrines in which they no longer believe. They criticize the use of church resources to which they no longer contribute. They condescendingly seek to counsel the brethren whom they no longer sustain. Confrontive, except of themselves, of course, they leave the church, but they cannot leave the church alone. Therefore, brothers and sisters, quiet goodness must persevere, even when, as prophesied, a few actually rage in their anger against that which is good. Likewise, the arrogance of critics must be met by the meekness and articulateness of believers, If sometimes ringed by resentment, we must still reach out, especially for those whose hands hang down. If our shortcomings as a people are occasionally highlighted, then let us strive to do better. End quote. Amen. I love that. Yeah, that's great counsel. Not always easy, but great counsel. So let's go on in verse 8 and look at the blessings of those that are members of the Lord's church. In verse 8, Therefore thus saith the Lord unto you, with whom the priesthood hath continued through the lineage of your fathers, for ye are lawful heirs according to the flesh. This is referring to being part of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Going on. And have been hid from the world with Christ in God. Therefore your life and the priesthood have remained and must needs remain through you and your lineage until the restoration of all things spoken by the mouths of all the holy prophets since the world began. Now, let's take a look here in verse 11, because we have all these blessings available. How can we help others? In verse 11, Therefore, blessed are ye if ye continue in my goodness, a light unto the Gentiles, and through this priesthood, a Savior unto my people Israel. The Lord hath said it. Amen. Amen indeed. Notice how important that is to fill ourselves with light so we can be a light unto others and to invite others to participate in the ordinances of the priesthood. These are blessings that aren't just intended for us, but for us to share. Absolutely. From the Institute Manual, we have a quote from President Russell M. Nelson. This is from October 1990 General Conference. He says, quote, You are one of God's noble and great spirits, held in reserve to come to earth at this time. In your pre-mortal life, you were appointed to help prepare the world for the great gathering of souls that will precede the Lord's second coming. You are one of a covenant people. You are an heir to the promise that all the earth 
will be blessed by the seed of Abraham, and that God's covenant with Abraham will be fulfilled through his lineage in these latter days. End quote. Excellent. It's an amazing promise. Well, let's go on to section 87. And as we do, consider these names. Noah, Joseph of Egypt, Lehi, Samuel the Lamanite. When you think of these names, think of the prophecies of these mighty prophets. When you hear their names, do you remember their warnings? Let's look at one such warning here from the prophet Joseph Smith to the people of the United States. We'll take our introduction from Revelations in Context from the Gospel Library app. And by the way, we'll be doing just a brief segment of this article. I strongly recommend you read the whole thing. It's outstanding. Remember how easy it is to link to it. It's in the upper right-hand corner right next to the section heading for the section that you're reading. A few days before Christmas, 1832, Latter-day Saints in Kirtland came in from the cold, damp air to sit by the light of their warm, flickering fires. They opened up their local newspaper, the Painesville Telegraph, to find alarming news. 700 miles to the south, the legislature of South Carolina, a state within the United States, had declared null and void taxes placed on imported goods by the federal government. This move created a nullification crisis that challenged the right of the federal government to enforce its own laws. War loomed on the horizon. These tariffs had been established to protect northern manufacturers from foreign competition. Southern farmers found them unfair. Why should they pay more for goods their region did not produce? Andrew Jackson, the President of the United States, issued a proclamation in which he warned that South Carolina's rejection of federal tariffs was an act of rebellion that could end in bloodshed. South Carolina promptly responded by preparing for war. Compromise seemed nowhere in sight. The accounts read by Kirtland's residents sounded the war drum. Let one menacing federal bayonet glitter upon our borders, one account read, and it will be a war of sovereigns. Joseph Smith followed this conflict closely through the newspapers that passed into Kirtland. He appended a note in his history about the people of South Carolina declaring their state a free and independent nation, and the proclamation against this rebellion given by President Jackson. And then, following these lines, Joseph inserted what he called a prophecy on war, a revelation he dictated to his clerk, Frederick G. Williams, on Christmas Day, 1832, just days after the startling news appeared in the Kirtland Papers. That revelation is known today as Doctrine and Covenants 87. Interesting. So let's take a look at the revelation itself, starting in verse 1. Verily thus saith the Lord concerning the wars that will shortly come to pass, beginning at the rebellion of South Carolina, which will eventually terminate in the death and misery of many souls. And the time will come that war will be poured out upon all nations, beginning at this place, for behold, the southern states shall be divided against the northern states, and the southern states will call on other nations, even the nation of Great Britain, as it is called. And they shall also call upon other nations in order to defend themselves against other nations, and then war shall be poured out upon all nations. And it shall come to pass after many days, slaves shall rise up against their masters, who shall be marshaled and disciplined for war. So we have this revelation, yeah. and we have the South Carolina threatening rebellion. But what happened? What happened yeah. next? Well, let's continue on in Revelations in context. It says, To the great surprise of all, the nullification crisis ended almost before it began. In February of 1833, President Jackson orchestrated a lowered compromise tariff, asserting the rights of the federal government while satisfying the demands of states' rights secessionists. Crisis was averted. Peace had returned to the land. And President Jackson basked in what may have been his greatest triumph as president. The peaceful resolution of the crisis pleased everyone but the most ardent firebrands, as a follower of Christ, Joseph Smith loved peace and welcomed compromise. 
and he looked forward to the return of the Prince of Peace and his peaceful millennial reign. But the dire predictions contained in the prophecy on war, tied as they were to contemporary events, must have puzzled Joseph. The death and misery of many souls did not occur. The southern states continued to be divided against the north over the question of slavery, but the slaves did not rise up against their masters. And South Carolina did not call on Great Britain for help. Anyone looking for the fulfillment of the revelation in 1833 would have been disappointed. Joseph Smith seemed reluctant to spread news of his prophecy on war too widely. Even before the crisis had been averted, he told a newspaper editor that he was sure not many years shall pass away before the United States shall present such a scene of bloodshed as has not a parallel in the history of our nation. But he did not get any more specific than that. He did not mention South Carolina in his later teachings and sermons. When he compiled his revelations for publication in 1835, Joseph withheld Doctrine and Covenants 87 from the collection. After the nullification crisis ended peacefully, it seemed best to set the revelation aside during his lifetime. There again is another interesting fact. Section 87, as it says, was not included in the 1835 or 1844 Doctrine and Covenants. It would be included later in 1876. Right. Now, there's precedent for this. I don't fully understand the purposes, but if you want an ancient example, Alma the Younger gave a prophecy to his son Helaman before he left the people. And he insisted, this is in Alma 45, verses 9 through 14, insisted that even though he's giving him the prophecy, he was not to make it known until the prophecy was fulfilled. I always thought of it as this secret prophecy. We get to read it, but the people in his day and for hundreds of years, didn't get to read it. And yet, the Lord gave it. Going on in Revelations in Context, Joseph was sure of his prior revelations. He had felt the voice of God speaking through him before and had seen those words come to pass. He must have wondered if this revelation was a case of false prophecy, or if the prophecy was true, what would God have Joseph do now that peace, even if temporary, had been achieved? Three decades after Doctrine and Covenants 87 was received, South Carolina rebelled again. Convinced that Abraham Lincoln's election as U.S. president spelled trouble for the institution of slavery, the state legislature voted to secede from the United States. South Carolina's move triggered a war between North and South. Much death and misery resulted. Southerners called on Great Britain for help. Slaves rose up against their masters. All the while, the saints, now in their new mountain home in the West, toiled away on the foundations of yet another holy place, the Salt Lake Temple. That is amazing. But so was this really a prophecy? Or was Joseph just paying attention to the news of the day? From the Institute Manual... President Joseph Fielding Smith gives us this insight from his book, Church History and Modern Revelation. Quote, Scoffers have said it was nothing remarkable for Joseph Smith in 1832 to predict the outbreak of the Civil War and that others who did not claim to be inspired with prophetic vision had done the same. It is well known that senators and congressmen from the South had maintained that their section of the country had a right to withdraw from the Union, for it was a confederacy. And in 1832, war clouds were seen on the horizon. It was because of this fact that the Lord made known to Joseph Smith this revelation, stating that wars would shortly come to pass, beginning with the rebellion of South Carolina, which would eventually terminate in war being poured out upon all nations and in the death and misery of many souls. Now, we've used that phrase before multiple times. I just want to be clear, if you're not familiar with the death toll of the Civil War, it's between 620,000 and 750,000, and that's just soldiers dead, not to mention untold civilian deaths. Many souls indeed. Back to the quote. It may have been an easy thing in 1832 or even 1831 for someone to predict that there would come a division of the northern states and the southern states, for even then there were rumblings 
and South Carolina had shown the spirit of rebellion. It was not, however, within the power of man to predict in the detail which the Lord revealed to Joseph Smith what was shortly to come to pass as an outgrowth of the Civil War and the pouring out of war upon all nations, end quote. Now, two more thoughts on this. The first, even if it wasn't unusual for someone in 1832 to predict the coming Civil War, was it not still a prophecy? And what about additional details about the South seeking assistance from Great Britain and slaves rising up against their masters? And the second thought, if your testimony of the gospel is built on whether or not Joseph Smith prophesied the coming of the Civil War, you've got some work to do. Remember our discussion of Ezra Booth earlier this year? He joined the church because he'd witnessed a miraculous healing. How long did that last? It was about a year. A lasting testimony is built on revelation that you receive personally from Heavenly Father through the Holy Ghost. It is your Father in Heaven directly witnessing to you that you are His son or daughter. Jesus Christ is your personal Savior and Redeemer. There are prophets and apostles on the earth today to lead and guide us. And there is a plan for your own happiness and exaltation should you choose to follow it. Now, notice that although the prophecy was given on Christmas in 1832, the fulfillment was over three decades later. Remember that near the end of his mortal life, when Jesus Christ prophesied the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, it was fulfilled over three decades later. And what about Jeremiah and Lehi's prophesying of the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon? That happened more than a decade later. And what about Isaiah's prophesying of the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon, and then later the rise of Cyrus, and even named him? That was well over a century later. And as Jay mentioned at the beginning of the lesson, what about Noah prophesying the great flood? According to Moses chapter 8, that was 120 years later. So why does the fulfillment take so long sometimes? Is it that the Lord is giving us more time to doubt his servants? Or is it that he's giving us more time to listen and more time to repent? Great point. Thanks for that, John. Let's go on with verse 5. And it shall come to pass also that the remnants who are left of the land will marshal themselves and shall become exceedingly angry and shall vex the Gentiles with a sore vexation. And thus, with the sword and by bloodshed, the inhabitants of the earth shall mourn and with famine and and plague, and earthquake, and the thunder of heaven, and the fierce and vivid lightning also, shall the inhabitants of the earth be made to feel the wrath, and indignation, and chastening hand of an almighty God, until the consumption decreed hath made a full end of all nations, that the cry of the saints, and of the blood of the saints, shall cease to come up into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, meaning the Lord of hosts, from the earth, to be avenged of their enemies. Now, that's an important thing to remember. We've talked about this before, but the term Lord of hosts, that's a military implication, that the Lord is the Lord of the armies of heaven. Right. He's a inconquerable military force. Now, whether you live in the United States or not, You may be witnessing a polarization of ideas leading to people like those in verse 5 who have become exceedingly angry. There is increased intolerance, violence, and hatred. People are increasingly dividing into tribes. Politics have embraced what some have called an arena mentality. I picked a team and my team is the best, even if they're losing, and regardless of anything, your team is the worst. (laughs) How can we better understand one another? I'd like to take just a moment to issue to all of our listeners, including myself, a challenge. Take some time to self-reflect and, one, understand what you believe. This is not something that a lot of people do today. Number two, understand why you believe what you believe there are even less people who will do this. And number three, seek to understand 
why someone else believes differently. And I would submit that almost no one does this, or it's getting a lot more rare, and it really shouldn't. And if your answer to why someone believes differently than you do is because they're stupid or jerks or insert your favorite derogatory name here, try again. There's a better answer. Now, if our response to this three-part challenge is, yeah, my opponent sure needs to do this, please consider that we are the ones that need to consider this. Yeah, I know somebody who really needs to hear this. I, uh, oh. (laughs) Well illustrated, Jay. Thank you. Uh, Yeah. And can I offer one other thought? I love this idea of examining why we believe what we believe. I had a social studies teacher, Mr. Porterfield, in junior high, and he said something that was really impactful to me. He said, he used to be a lawyer, apparently, and he said, no one will respect what you believe unless you know why you believe it. And that was so cool because it made me really look back at what my beliefs were, even as a member of the church. And the answer can be because I received a revelation from God or a confirmation by the Spirit. But I needed to have a reason why, not just that I did, or not just that my parents did or somebody else I respected did. I needed to own it. And that was a really amazing thing for me to do. It's affected me the whole rest of my life. Okay, I believe this. Why do I believe it? I really think that's a great and important step. In light of the challenge that I've just put forth, I've been reflecting a lot lately on the concept of the importance of compromise. With so much political division in particular that I've seen on social media and other places, I've been pondering the need for ideals embraced both on the political left and the political right of the spectrum. Now, these thoughts are admittedly pertaining mostly to the United States, but I believe there are principles here that apply globally. President Dallin H. Oaks's talk in this last conference, April 2021, called Defending Our Divinely Inspired Constitution, this is at the beginning of the Sunday afternoon session, had a footnote reference that I found very life-changing. And let this be a lesson, always check the footnotes. Good counsel. Wonderful resources there. But this footnote was to a talk called The Necessity of Political Parties and the Importance of Compromise by Dr. David B. Magleby, a professor of political science at BYU. This was given in 2015. We'll include a link for the talk, but I strongly recommend that you listen to it. It's about 40 minutes long. One of the key takeaways that was particularly impactful to me was in regards to the importance of compromise. He says, quote, Compromise is not wrong in public life. It is the way we reconcile our differences. To acknowledge the importance of compromise is to recognize that we have different preferences, priorities, and approaches. It is also to acknowledge that everyone knows something and no one knows everything, end quote. Oh, that's a great insight. I really love that. I strongly encourage you to seek this out and spend some time with it. And again, the challenge to reflect on what you believe, why you believe it, and why someone else might believe differently. And if I could offer another great resource, if you're interested in a book, this is a great one for understanding differences and opinions. It's by Jonathan Haidt, who's a research psychologist. It's called The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. That is a really great book. This was a really helpful book to give me a perspective on what he calls the moral matrices that people build their beliefs on. It's really wonderful. It's very readable. And both John and I have read it, really enjoyed it. I've been through it a couple of times. So I think that can be a great resource. And I think his research was really helpful. Well, let's summarize this discussion with a quote from the Institute Manual. This is from Elder Neil A. Maxwell, the October 1982 General Conference. He says, quote, Alas, though we are asked to be peacemakers, we do live in a time when peace has been taken from the earth. War has been the almost continuing experience of modern man. There have been 141 wars, large and small, just since the end of World War II in 1945. 
as the American Civil War was about to begin, the Lord declared there would be a succession of wars poured out upon all nations, resulting in the death and misery of many souls. Moreover, that continuum of conflict will culminate in a full end of all nations. Meanwhile, let mortals, if they choose, put over-reliance upon mortal arms. And if I could insert, that idea of mortal arms that we put over-reliance on can include ideologies and political allegiances. Mm-hmm. Back to the quote. As for us, we shall put on the whole armor of God. And in the midst of such affliction, if we are righteous and we die, we die unto him. And if we live, we live unto him. End quote. Amen. I love that. So by doing all this, can we stop the impending wars from coming? No. But we can reach out to others in love and understanding as the Savior would. Let's go on to verse 8. Yes, please. Verse 8, Wherefore stand ye in holy places, and be not moved until the day of the Lord come, for behold, it cometh quickly, saith the Lord. Amen. Wonderful. Now, do you remember that phrase, stand ye in holy places? We actually talked about it earlier this year when we were covering Doctrine and Covenants section 45. That's right. There's a quote that we mentioned there that I wanted to give a little clip of again because it's so good in context of standing in holy places. This is from Sister Ann M. Dibb, April 2012 General Conference, where she said, quote, We might first consider the word place as a physical environment or a geographic location. However, a place can be a distinct condition, position, or state of mind. This means holy places can also include moments in time, moments when the Holy Ghost testifies to us, moments when we feel Heavenly Father's love, or moments when we receive an answer to our prayers. Even more, I believe any time you have the courage to stand for what is right, especially in situations where no one else is willing to do so, you are creating a holy place." End quote. Fantastic. So important. Let me share another quote from the Institute Manual. This is actually from the April 2003 General Conference. Elder Dennis B. Neuenschwander, he was serving in the presidency of the 70. He explained this. Three times in the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord counsels his people to stand in holy places. By the way, the next one will be in section 101. The context of his counsel is all the more significant as we look at the current condition of our world. Desolating disease, persecution, and war have an all too familiar face and have imposed themselves into our daily experience. In the face of such perplexing problems, the Lord counsels, Behold, it is my will that all they who call on my name and worship me according to mine everlasting gospel should gather together and stand in holy places. Holy places have always been essential to the proper worship of God. For Latter-day Saints, such holy places include venues of historic significance, our homes, sacrament meetings, and temples. Much of what we reverence, and what we teach our children to reverence, as holy and sacred, is reflected in these places. The faith and reverence associated with them and the respect we have for what transpires or what has transpired in them, make them holy. The importance of holy places and sacred space in our worship can hardly be overestimated. These sacred places inspire our faith and give us encouragement to be true to that faith and to move forward despite the challenges that may cross our path. So let's do that. Let's stand in holy places. Yeah. There's so many fights to fight. There's so many things to stand up for. But at all times, let's be in holy places. And think for a minute about, of all the opinions that can be said of us because of our beliefs, we should care much less about what's written about us in the book of man and care much more about what's written about us in the book of life or in the book of remembrance. 
What an interesting set of revelations we've gone over in this lesson. This was really fascinating. Yeah. We're grateful that you were able to join with us as we went through 85 through 87. And we look forward to going over more revelations with you. Keep reading your scriptures. Keep opening your mind and heart to that revelation that you will receive when you take that time. And act on what you experience. Act on what the Lord reveals to you. Absolutely. And remember to stand in holy places and remember what holy places mean. And we'll talk to you more from a holy place in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans. 